All right. I guess most of our participants today are here. Um, welcome again to everybody. Uh, great to see you all. Um, at this very first Euro Tech Talk, I'm very happy to, happy to, to open this session today. I'm Anita. I'm working at the Eurotech University's Brussels office. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar yet with the Eurotech Universities Alliance, we are an alliance of six technical universities all over Europe and in Israel as well. So we have the Technical University of Denmark in our alliance, EPFL in Switzerland, we have Ecole Polytechnique in France, in Paris, we have the Technion in Israel, uh, TU Eindhoven in the Netherlands, and the Technical University in Munich in Germany. Um, as an alliance, well, we do quite a lot of things together, but one of our main purposes is actually to bring researchers together and engage them in collaborations, facilitate collaborations in research. And um, why we are doing this is pretty simple, um, because we believe that, yeah, it's not possible for single researchers or single institutions or single countries for that matter to solve the problems um, our world is facing today. And so in this spirit of collaboration um, is also the setting of our Eurotech Talks. This is a new series that we are kicking off today with this uh, talk. And uh, the idea of this uh, ETS Eurotech Talks is not to have just one researcher, but tandems of researchers from two different universities present on a topic of their choosing and um, explain us uh, yeah, their latest results, some joint projects they are undertaking and give us a bit of insight in their work at their universities. So um, I'm very pleased to welcome our speakers today, which is a tandem of TU Eindhoven and EPFL. So welcome uh, Professor Menno Prince. He's oh. a full professor in molecular, molecular biosensing for medical diagnostics at TU Eindhoven. And he will present together with Hatice Altu from EPFL, where she heads the Bio Nanophotonic Systems Laboratory. So Menno and Hatice will present us today, um, yeah, the research they are undertaking in nanophotonic and single molecule biosensing that they are doing at their institutions. Um, you are very welcome to ask questions. Um, both speakers said they would appreciate an interactive discussion, so I encourage you to, to do that. And um, yeah, you can either write your, your question in the chat or also raise your little virtual hand and then speak up in person when you're asked to do so. And the last word, um, we will be recording this session today. So it will be available afterwards. And uh, yeah, that's all from my side. And uh, Menno, then I think you're our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Anita, for your introduction. and. Uh... Nice, uh, thanks that you, the audience is here. I see several f familiar names. Uh, I'll, uh, I have the honor to, to kick off this session. Uh, actually, Hatice and myself, we are both part of a European collaboration, uh, the Consens ITN Network. I'll say a few words about that collaboration. Uh, then I'll speak about the, uh, the work that we do in Eindhoven. Thereafter, Hatice will take over. So let me share my screen. I think you will see the slides now. Is that correct? Now let go. Let me go to presenter mode. Do you see now my slides in the yes. correct mode? Okay. Yes, it's perfect. Uh, uh, by the way, on my screen, I don't see you, and I probably I will not also also not see hands being raised or questions being asked. So, uh, Anita, please interrupt me if anything is happening that uh, okay. that I should that I should respond to. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to speak about sensors for real-time biochemical monitoring. We're all familiar with sensors that measure physical parameters continuously, like light, sound, pressure, temperature. But in the chemical domain, that's still quite a, uh, an extraordinary thing if you can measure a chemical uh, compound continuously. Uh, a, a one that is already available is sensors for measuring glucose. Uh, very useful for patients with diabetes. They wear uh, the sensor on the arm or on the belly. And this gives continuous data day and night, uh, every minute, uh, these sensors, they report uh, glucose concentrations in the skin. But for other molecules, uh, like hormones, like drugs, like proteins, nucleic acids, sensors for biochemical monitoring are not yet available. Uh, but it would be very useful. Uh, here I, on the first slide, I sketch an image of a patient, uh, maybe in an intensive care. 
uh, with a catheter uh, that's connected to a sensor and that would report um, uh, measurements on a screen. Uh, so on the screen, of course, of a uh, heart rate, blood pressure, all that would be reported, but now maybe also a chemical parameter like the level of a pharmaceutical drug or the level of inflammatory markers. Well, that's actually the, the, uh, the dream that we are going after, uh, developing sensors for real-time biochemical monitoring for other molecules than glucose. Um, in my talk, I'll present results of many people. They are listed here and also the, the funding agencies. I mentioned already the European collaboration that Hatice and myself are part of, that's paid by uh, the European Union. And we have also other sources of funding. And the future of sensing, as we see it, is that we're trying to solve challenges in society. And the challenges uh, uh, or the, the, the situations are sketched here on the right. It's like a patient in a hospital. It's maybe a bioreactor uh, as a production facility in industry. It's maybe an environmental system like a, like a river or a lake. Or it's maybe an organ on a chip, a very small biological uh, system being studied in a, in a chip-like device. And uh, for those different uh, uh, systems, uh, one of the problems is that they uh, have degrees of unpredictability. So these are biological systems. And um, these have biological variations, and therefore it would be really interesting to be able to measure continuously this the biochemical state of the system so that uh, actions can be taken when needed. So the solutions should be sensitive and specific, small, ideally integrated, and of course reliable. Um, we think that continuous monitoring will play a big role, and also the, the, the knowledge of the system, and I summarize it here as being a digital twin, because you can have data, but you will know how to act on the data if you have a good understanding of your system, the digital twin concept. And the kind of sensors that will be used are biochemical sensors and physical sensors, where, of course, in this talk, we'll be speaking about the biochemical sensors. I mentioned already that continuous monitoring is already available for glucose. These are small sensors worn on the skin. And glucose is a, a molecule at high concentrations, whereas other molecules like drugs and proteins and nucleic acids, they, have, they are chemically very different. And also they have very uh, uh, different concentrations, much, much lower, 1,000, 1 million, 1 billion, and even lower concentrations. So generic technologies are needed to be able to continuously measure also such molecules. And there's uh, several activities ongoing in, in, in the world and in literature. Uh, uh, novel concepts are being reported. Here I have two examples. This is a sensor that is worn in a, in, a, in a wristband and it measures electrolytes and it measures also metabolites, all high concentration molecules. And on the right is a sketch of a molecular sensing concept based on conformational changes of molecules. So when the analyte here sketched in pink binds to the binder, which is sketched in blue, then the, the, the shape of the molecule changes and therefore an electrical signal can be measured. And these are very nice uh, advances, but also they, uh, they leave room still open for innovation and improvement. And that's mainly on the side of the low concentrations. It's very difficult to continuously measure molecules at micromolar, nanomolar, and picomolar concentrations. And that's where we, where we set out in our European collaboration called Consense, where we're aiming to develop a game change in continuous biosensing where we focus on affinity-based sensing uh, and not only the molecular engineering of those affinity binders, but also the optical detection techniques to measure the binding events that are taking place in the sensor. And in this European program, there, are 15, uh, uh, there will be 15 PhD students working from, well, you see here the, the academic institutions, so myself from TUE and her teacher from EPFL. There are several biotech companies involved and also large medical technology companies. And we investigate a wide variety of approaches like uh, designed affinity binders, uh, um, uh, nucleic acid, uh, protein uh, uh, conjugates, uh, uh, complete uh, hybrid systems, uh, protein switches, uh, um, optical detection technology based on particle motion, plasmonics, nanophotonics, and also uh, uh, testing in in vitro cell systems. And it's, uh, uh, it's on the one hand, there's a variety of approaches, but there's a, a clear common approach. All of those uh, techniques are based on affinity-based sensing, and also they are all optics-based uh, with the aim to move into this, uh, low uh, this range of lower concentrations, the micromolar, the nanomolar, the picomolar. Now, within Eindhoven, we have a cluster of, uh, of, of uh, research uh, uh, groups uh, investigating different approaches, but all 
focusing on single molecule resolution. And we do such studies by combining knowledge on the molecules themselves, knowledge and experience with nanoparticles, optical and micros microscopic technologies, and of course, data analysis, modeling, and simulations. Now, you may wonder, why would you want to design a sensor based on single molecule resolution? Well, the, the thinking behind it is, is, is very simple, that if you, if you have biochemical interactions taking place in the sensor, and you want to extract the maximum of information, then you have to go to the single molecule regime, because in the end, all materials are based on single molecules. In the end, biology is discrete. So if you if, if the basics of your sensor are, are single molecule uh, based, then you extract maximum information, then, and then you can use that information for achieving good sensitivity, precision, accuracy, speed, etc. Now, within this MEX cluster, we have uh, three uh, uh, different approaches, one on, based on particle mobility, one based on single molecule fluorescence, and the other one based on plasmonics. And I'll focus in this talk on the world on particle mobility. So what is biosensing based on particle mobility? Well, we uh, published our first paper in 2018, and uh, the basis of the technique is having particles on a surface, and those particles are biofunctionalized, then they are coated with affinity molecules, and they are uh, in contact with a substrate that is also functionalized with biomolecules. So in this sketch, there's antibodies on the particle and there's antibodies on the molecule. And this particle is kept in close proximity to the substrate by a tether. In this case, a flexible DNA molecule that keeps the particle close to the surface, but the particle is still mobile. However, when molecules to be detected are entered, and those are sketched here in green, then those may cause so-called sandwich bonds, the uh, binding to the affinity molecules on the particle, as well as affinity molecules on the substrate. And in that case, you could, you could say there's, there's a second a single molecule bond in the system. First of all, there was this tether, and now there's also this very compact uh, arrangement of proteins. And this uh, appearance of this compact arrangement of proteins, this sandwich bond, changes strongly the mobility of the particle, which is something that we can easily measure. So let me sketch it now again in a movie, same uh, principle. So we have particles on our surface, and now I start the movie, then these particles move due to Brownian motion, and they are kept in close proximity due to this tether, and these molecules of interest in green, they, they are flown in solution over the sensor, and they have reversible biochemical, uh, react, biochemical bonds, in fact, biophysical bonds, with the affinity molecules. And when a bond is formed, this changes the way the particle moves, and that is what we detect optically. So to summarize, we have particles with a typical size of about one micrometer, in close proximity of a surface, uh, tethered by a double uh, piece of double standard DNA. The particles are functionalized, the substrate is functionalized, and molecules are entered in solution, which we call the targets or the biomarkers or the analytes. Now, if you have targets present, then the particle can transition between unbound and bound states. And those are, this transition is caused by single molecule interactions. And by monitoring the time characteristics of these switchings between unbound and bound, and we do it for many particles at the same time, hundreds to thousands of particles, we can collect statistics and we can determine, or we can measure those response curves and then determine the, con the concentration of the analyte. And the way we detected the state change from unbound to bound is by looking at the particle motion pattern. So this is a, a top view microscopic image of, uh, of a single particle where we look at the X, Y position that the particle has, has, uh, has occupied over, for example, a period of one minute. And then we can see if the particle has been occupying, in this case, a disc-like area, or if it, the particle motion was much more restricted and confined, for example, in a stripe-like pattern. And then with an algorithm, we, add, we, we attribute states. We say that this particle at that moment in time was in the unbound state, and maybe in another uh, moment in time, it was in the bound state. So if the target concentration is low for this kind of sandwich, uh, sandwich biosensor, then most of the time the particles, the, uh, the, the particles are mobile, and once in a while a particle transitions into a bound state. If the co target concentration is much higher, we see a much more active switching of the particle, because there are more molecules bound in the system to the particle, there's a higher probability per unit time that the particle transitions to a bound state. And therefore, we see this repeated switching of particle between bound and unbound state. And those switches, those events, we can recognize, and then we can measure the, the lifetimes of the state and uh, make histograms and uh, uh, do statistical analysis. So this is 
a, a single molecule sensor in the sense that the, that the nature of the signal is digital. You see digital switching, sudden switches of particles from bound to unbound state. And this is what the data looks like in reality. This is a trajectory of a single particle. Uh, here the particle is very mobile along the x-axis, then suddenly it's less mobile, then it's more mobile, less mobile, etc. And the algorithm recognizes, you see these, uh, the, these red lines that indicate time points where the algorithm recognizes the switches between bound and unbound states. And then we get to the state attributions by the algorithm. So we get dig digital signals caused by individual biomolecular interactions. And then it's the statistical analysis that gives us detailed information for sensitivity, specificity, precision, accuracy, accuracy, and robustness. So how do we do these experiments? Well, we have a sensing cartridge, and in this cartridge there are the particles. We have some optics to, to monitor the motion of the particles. We have a sample, and we have some pumping system to, to pull or push the, the fluid sample through the cartridge. And meanwhile, we monitor continuously the motion of these particles. And the earliest experiments were experiments based on oligonucleotides. So we had a sandwich arrangement like this. So we would have single-stranded DNA in solution, uh, single-stranded oligos on the particle, also oligos on the substrate. And then um, we would look at the activity of these particles as a function of concentration of uh, oligo of the fluid entered into the cartridge. And this, uh, the, the behavior of the sensor it, uh, has then this uh, hill-like shape, it's the hill equation, which is an indicator that this is a proper bimolecular uh, interaction. So we published this um, and also looked at data um, uh, measurements in, in clean solutions, in more uh, complex solutions like undiluted filtered blood plasma, and we saw a very similar uh, 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 properties. So here you would see, for example, an experiment where we increase the concentration of the analyte, then we could decrease it to zero. We increase it again, we decrease it to zero. So the sensor uh, uh, gives continuous data. The sensor is reversible. And if we plot the data in a dose response curve, we get behavior that is in agreement with the theory of biomolecular uh, interactions, which gave us confidence that this would be a sensor that, uh, uh, that would be maybe generalizable and also suited for many applications. So subsequent topics that we studied were sensitivity, the dynamics of the system, specificity, tunability, generalizability, multiplexing, precision, stability, accuracy, and of course, translation now. Because uh, we see this as a, as, a, as a measurement platform suited for many applications. So we want to translate it also to society. But let me give an example of uh, the kind of scientific work that we do, because in this, those first experiments, uh, the molecules uh, on the substrate were physisorbed. So just by um, yeah, protein physisorption to a polymer substrate or to a glass substrate. Well, that is uh, uh, sends us with only a limited lifetime. So we, were, we moved uh, thereafter to a system where a polyelectrolyte is coupled to a substrate and then covalently we attach the tether and also we attach the substrate side binders and discus sensors which are much more stable and suited for longer term measurements which we published in the ACS sensor. So this is a, an example of chemical work that we do to, to, to investigate and improve sensor performance. Now the, the until now I've been speaking out about sandwich uh, type assays where we have binders on particle, binders on substrate that both can bind to the target molecule in solution. But then the target molecule has to be quite big because two affinity binders should be able to bind at the same time. If the target molecule is small, you cannot use this sandwich arrangement and you have to, to move to another arrangement well known in the field of affinity assays. It's called a competition assay or an inhibition assay. So let me tell you what it is. So this is a competition assay where we have um, analytes uh, that we want to measure. And uh, the particle in this case is functionalized with so-called analyte analogs. So these are molecules that look very much like the molecules that are to be detected in solution. But the, the, the thing is they're different because they are now conjugated, they're coupled to the particle, chemically coupled. And on the substrate here, we have again affinity binders, in this case, antibodies. Now, if there's no analyte in solution, it's a blank measurement, then these particles have a high probability per unit time to transition from an unbound to a bound state, simply because these analyte analogs have a strong affinity to the detection molecules on the surface. However, if the analytes are present in solution, here sketched as the, uh, the yellow molecules with the, the, the gray surface, those can bind to the antibodies and then block the binding sites of the antibodies. Therefore, the probability that the particle transitions from an unbound to a bound state reduces because the antibodies are blocked. 
So that's why it's called a, a competition assay or an inhibition assay. And we have uh, shown this principle for several molecules. And for example, uh, also for creatinine, it's a quite a small molecule with a size of 113, so 113 uh, Daltons, which we conjugated to the particles uh, using uh, hybridization. And the, the experiment looks like this, where we have a creatinine concentration that is low, then higher, and then low, and again higher, etc. So there's a switching level, a changing level over time of this creatinine in solution. And we measure the activity, the sensing signal, and also as a function of time. First of all, we see that the sensor responds very rapidly within three minutes. And if we plot this data in a so-called dose response curve with signal on the y-axis and concentration on the x-axis, you get this nice S-like shape, which is like the Hill equation. It's, it's, um, it shows that we have a proper bimolecular interaction taking place in this sensor. Now, we are generalizing this sensor, looking at uh, 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 many different molecules. Um, in competition assay formats, as well as sandwich assay formats, using antibodies and also oligonucleotides and aptamers as binders. And uh, for very small molecules, like uh, I showed creatinine, but we're also working on cortisol and, for example, on glycoalkaloids, which are bitter tasting compounds, which are important in certain food processes. And on the side of um, uh, the larger molecules, uh, we've been measuring thrombin, we're measuring post-procalcitonin, IL-6, TNF alpha, interferon gamma, and also lactoferrin, and these are uh, antibacterial or infl inflammatory markers. Now, this, uh, um, uh, there's many aspects that we work on. I'm, this slide focuses on the, the biochemical and the, and the assay aspects, but we're also working on the system aspects, like making the sensor faster, like uh, making the sensor smaller, so that in the end, uh, it will be so small that it, it can be worn on or in the body. Now, uh, to make that a reality, we have set up a, uh, a spin-off company called Helia Biomonitoring, where we move from research to prototypes to product development and to society. And I have a couple of pictures of our startup company. Here you see uh, uh, the lab that we presently have. Uh, we, we are making uh, systems to measure many, many sensors uh, in parallel at the same time to, to collect statistics and do process development. And uh, well, we have smaller and bigger systems that we work on for, for a variety of applications. And um, all of this is based on a solid foundation of scientific research. Uh, I mentioned the first publication in 2018. Uh, in 2020, we published about multiplexing, later about small molecule monitoring, about variabilities in these sensors, about uh, stability improvement. I showed the click coupling to the low fouling polymer in one of the slides. Uh, we focus on data analysis for real-time detection and also uh, uh, modeling studies on the limits of the dynamic response and the limits of measuring low concentrations over long time spans. So this closes my presentation. Uh, so we, we are looking towards this future of uh, developing smart solution, solutions for a variety of settings and a variety of problems being patients in industry, environmental monitoring, but also miniaturized biological systems like organ on a chip where we want to combine data from chemical sensors and physical sensors to get to smart solutions. Now, this is the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Manu. Thank you for this presentation. And indeed, um, so far I don't see a question yet, but now is the time if you have any questions. So please write in the chat or raise your hand. Everything clear? Yeah, and if no, no questions, then of course we <laughs> I can I guess you had the perfect presentation then. Ah, well, I, I see one hand. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Pia. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. See how I can Oh, now uh, your mic is off again. Can you switch your mic on? Oh, so. Sorry. Yeah, so, now uh, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. now you can hear. Yeah, I just uh, want to be sure that I have an, enough environment. Yeah, so thank you very much. Very exciting. Uh, it's really uh, one of the things that I was looking for a long time, uh, just to see. Uh, by the chance, we are so close to each other that we never had the chance to meet. I'm True. from uh, here <laughs> yeah, from Electrical Engineering Department, the Eco Group, and the Flux. And maybe I will stop by uh, sometime. And uh, because I'm working in terahertz field, not in yep. photonics, and uh, we have a lot of ideas uh, for using terahertz for early detections uh, for medical application like cancers. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the main ideas is also to look at the exosomes. I don't know if you heard about it before. No, can you say it again? Exosomes. Exosomes. Okay. Yes, yes. sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So th those things, you know, this, they are, uh, I hope they are, have such a, a environmental uh, uh, behavior like uh, what we can do, you, what you are doing, and then we measure them in, in terahertz. This is what of the bottlenecks, uh, let's say, platform. And I don't know if you're looking in your technology, uh, uh, you're trying to do something with photonic integrated circuit because I'm working on that also. So I don't know how big is your uh, other system, including uh, microscope, lasers, these things, sources. Uh, you had uh, thought about integration of this uh, as a compact system in the end. Okay, okay. So let me uh, give the answer first to the first question, which was about exosomes. Uh, these extracellular vesicles are really interesting. We are also looking at it, and uh, uh, we have a, a collaboration with uh, Vito. It's an institute in uh, in Belgium, and uh, they are making samples as exosomes. So we we are planning also to measure such samples and see how they behave in our sensor. Uh, concerning miniaturization, uh, presently the the reader system is uh, has the size of a shoebox, and uh, that's sufficient for for a wide range of applications already. But, uh, for example, if you look about uh, look to patient monitoring, then sensors have to be much smaller. They have to be uh, so small that they can be worn on and in the far future, even in the body. And uh, yeah, that's something that we still uh, uh, have to work on and, and, and are going to work on. And in my cluster, there's, for example, Peter Zylstra. He's a strong person in optics, and uh, he's also looking at photonic integration of certain sensor concepts. So uh, I'll be happy to, to discuss with you later. Yeah, it will be my pleasure. So I, I will arrange time soon to stop by. Thank you very much. Super. Very exciting. Thank you. Okay, I see two more questions or three yes. more. Yes, Oliver was, was first. Oliver, maybe? Hello. Thank you for this nice presentation. Um, I, I do have to admit I'm not the optical guy. I like to work uh, non-optically. Yeah. But um, actually, we're targeting into similar directions. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to get rid of any kind of sample preparation of, of, of blood per se. So yeah. we can also work in non-optical conditions. Is your system also capable of, of working under you know, the rather harsh conditions you have in whole blood? Um, um, whole blood is a very complicated matrix, first of all, because there are cells. And it's full of red blood cells and uh, to a lesser extent white blood cells and these uh yeah complicated not only the the, the uh, say the hydrodynamics of the, the solution but also in our case uh, the yeah these cells they can scatter the light and they can disturb the motion of the particles so we we didn't study that and also we we think it uh, measuring directly in blood um uh, of course it's the dream for the far future but it's it's not, uh, it, it'll make, if you want to measure immediately in that matrix, it, it'll make uh, your timelines very long and the required costs for getting to society also very high. So uh, we would rather, that's the approach we're now taking, we would rather integrate our sensor with already existing catheters because then, then the matrix is strongly simplified. For example, microdialysis catheters, then the matrix is quite clean and you can already um, uh, measure molecules uh, with relevance for, for society. Thank you. All right, we also have William who has a question. Uh, yes, yeah, first of all, thanks for the talk, it was super interesting. Um, but I did have a question, first of all, regarding, so when the, when you look at the motion of the particle, you binarize it, right? You say either it's bound or unbound. Yeah. However, I, I mean, I imagine the particle is quite some intermediate states. Have you tried to, instead of for each particle saying it's bound or unbound, adding intermediate states and maybe increasing your resolution? Yes, it's, it's a very good suggestion. Actually, what we are now developing is the software to recognize, for example, unbound state, bound state, and then distinguish between a single bound state versus a double bound state. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, the, uh, and, 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 and in certain experiments, there's a nice distinction between the two, and, and we can also look at transition, um, tr transition time scales between these states independently. Yeah. Okay. Okay, nice. Thanks. And then I had one more question, actually. You were talking about integrating these biosensors as a wearable device. Yeah. How do you see this being possible knowing it's optics? So I, I'm not an expert in miniaturization of optics, but it seems more complicated to me. Uh, I don't know if you have some examples of where it's been done. Um, actually, these, these particles, they strongly scatter the light. So we get lots of photons from single particles. So there's no reason why it could not be miniaturized. OK, awesome, thanks. So we also have a question in the chat. 
uh, from Arnold. Can you see that, Menno? Yeah, I see it now. The the non the the competitor solution has a limit protection minimal. Right? Is that okay? Uh, the 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 concentration range um, of of a dose response curve depends on many aspects. It's the affinity of the target to the to the binder, but it's also the density of molecules on the particle and the density of molecules on the substrate. And indeed, the creatinine assay we have tuned to be sensitive in the range of micromolar to millimolar because that's the relevant concentration range for creatinine. But we're also measuring other molecules. I mentioned uh, cortisol, I mentioned the glycoalkaloids. And those, uh, they are in the uh, low micromolar range and even um, uh, going towards the nanomolar range. And so we have tuned those assays those competitive assays to be sensitive in the in the high nanomolar to low micromolar range. Is, is that an answer to your question? Okay. Apparently so, yeah. yeah. So a last one for Michael, and then I suggest we move on to Hatice. Um, hi, man. Uh, thanks a lot for the great presentation. Um, I actually have a question uh, very similar between Oliver's and Shihab's. So um, have you have you actually had any experience in uh, finding or identifying molecules as such, so proteins, uh, uh, free floating proteins or some proteins on extra uh, vesicle, extracellular vesicles uh, inside, uh, let's say some, some fluid, because there are, <laughs> there's a huge var variety of those. <laughs> so finding them uh, using just optics uh, is a little bit hard. I imagine um, deep learning is very much important for this. So did you have any experience with this? Well, uh, um, proteins on the surface of vesicles, we have not, uh, not yet measured, but we are measuring and, uh, proteins in solution. I mentioned uh, IL-6, procalcitonin, TNF-alpha, uh, thrombin, lactoferrin. Those are all uh, proteins in, in complex biological matrices that we measure using the, the binders and the optics. Yes, right, but they are uh, pre-filtered, um, so pre right? Um, they they are diluted at least. Yeah, they're not yeah. always pre-filtered. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I see. And right. the thing is, our sensor is is very sensitive. That means we have the freedom always to dilute our sample, and uh, in diluted samples, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you get much more robust measurements. Great. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Menno, so much. Um, My pleasure. And then, uh, Hatice, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Let me first share the screen. Oops, sorry. Okay, do you see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Thank okay, you. in the presenter mode, I guess, because I don't know which one is show sometimes. Yes, it's correct. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, uh, hello, everyone. Um, so thanks, firstly, Anita, for organizing this event. And uh, thank you, Mena, for <laughs> kicking off the session with a great introduction. So I will follow up uh, on uh, what Menno was uh, talking about on biosensors, uh, but now using nanophotonics. And I will, in particular, share some examples from my lab at EPFL uh, called Bio Nanophotonic Systems Laboratory. So uh, one of the mission of our lab is to develop uh, science and technology for optical biosensors. Uh, and uh, we would like to use these sensors for uh, basic research, like in life science, uh, but also in uh, diagnostic applications. So in our case, as the title of our lab uh, kind of indicates, uh, we use nanophotonics at the core of our technology, but we couple it with uh, uh, wafer scale fabrication. I will show some examples. Uh, we, uh, we integrate uh, these devices with microfluidics, functionalize them, make microarrays, and uh, uh, most of the time we are currently like uh, kind of trying to implement imaging-based uh, modalities uh, that can use either optical or spectroscopic imaging uh, so that that can also couple with uh, different uh, data science uh, techniques. So why nanophotonics? Uh, for, first of all, why photonics? Uh, photonics provides uh, immunity to electromagnetic interference uh, compared to, let's say, uh, other optical, uh, other uh, transduction mechanisms like electrical or mechanical. Uh, but uh, it also provides ultra-wide uh, bandwidth uh, on the photonics. But at the same time, the long uh, wavelength range, uh, the wavelength size uh, uh, of optics, uh, let's say on the order of a micron, is much larger uh, than the nanometric uh, uh, targets that we are trying to uh, analyze and detect, uh, let's say ranging 
from uh, uh, RNAs on the order of nanometer to viruses on the order of, uh, uh, let's say, 50 to 100 nanometers. So they are much uh, smaller uh, than the wavelength of light. And this is why we are actually interested to use uh, nanophotonics, because by using optical nanostructures, what we call uh, optical resonators, uh, we can focus the light into nanoscale volumes. And this uh, uh, focusing of light then enable us uh, to actually kind of um, uh, overcome this uh, size mismatch issue. And furthermore, with the high uh, near field enhancements, we can have very strong light matter interaction. So as a result, uh, nanophotonics is actually quite interesting to achieve high sensitivity, at the same time, uh, small footprint multiplexing and integration. So um, there are various, uh, let's say, approaches in nanophotonics where people are trying to control the optical response and functionality of these different resonators by using different uh, materials, let's say from metals to dielectrics to 2D materials or even hybrid systems. And uh, within, a, a, let's say, a, a material system, you can also uh, choose uh, and change the size, shape, and arrangement of these structures to get like really interesting uh, uh, responses. And in our case, uh, we also you know, look at different parts of electromagnetic spectrum from visible uh, all the way uh, to the infrared. Uh, on the visible, I will uh, show a few examples where we are kind of trying to leverage, uh, let's say, more uh, established and low-cost uh, CMOS and LEDs uh, to make more, uh, let's say, low-cost devices. But also infrared is uh, really interesting for uh, spectroscopic detection. So uh, we have, uh, let's say, currently three different directions that are uh, in our lab, although the boundaries uh, between them are not actually uh, strict. In one uh, case, we are trying to develop uh, point of care systems, point of uh, care diagnostic systems where miniaturization is always kind of uh, one of the target. In the other area, we are looking at uh, uh, um, spectroscopy techniques where we are trying to really uh, uh, tap into to chemical specific detection or even confirmation sensitive detection. And uh, we are also trying to develop systems uh, uh, um, uh, for uh, live cell studies, in particular single cell studies, and I will show uh, one example on that. So let me uh, start with the point of care diagnostic systems. Um, so this is uh, one of the devices that we uh, recently developed, it's a portable uh, and low-cost nanophotonic biosensor uh, because it's uh, you know operating in the uh, in the let's say visible wavelength range. So we have a visible LED and a, and a standard CMOS camera, and then we have here a nanophotonic uh, chip which actually enables us to uh, have rapid and digital detection of biomarkers and that we use for uh, diagnostics applications. So the the chip, the chip itself here is actually key uh, to have uh, this uh, digital detection. And the way it works, uh, uh, this chip is a so-called plasmonic chip. Uh, so it's uh, basically a, a thin film of uh, gold that we perforate uh, with uh, uh, holes. And the size of these holes are on the order of 200 nanometer. And the periodicity is about 600 nanometer. So this is just a sketch of it. And uh, this structure is actually known in the field, in the nanophotonics field, um, uh, nanohole array that can lead to uh, light transmission uh, called extraordinary optical transmission or EOT effect. And it's the resonance that transmits light at a specific wavelength that you can control by the periodicity or by the, uh, the shape and the size of these uh, holes. And in our uh, earlier paper in 2018, uh, we actually uh, realized that uh, when the nanoholes are, uh, when there are like uh, uh, nanoparticles, and they are actually filled with nanoparticles uh, that are kind of comparable to the size of these nanoholes, they can quench the EOT uh, signal locally. And uh, it, it's actually quite strong that you can even see by a, a, like a, a CMOS camera that uh, was available in this uh, type of a, uh, let's say, portable device. And to use it for sensing, it's kind of similar to what Menno was describing, that we use actually a sandwich assay. We uh, function. Uh, we functionalize the surface with, um, uh, with uh, capture antibodies, and then we functionalize the nanoparticles with uh, detection antibodies. And within the presence of analyte, let's say this red one, uh, the binding takes place. And if this binding happens to be um, uh, in the nanoparticle or very close to the uh, nanoparticle, then we can actually kind of digitally count uh, this, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the presence of nanoparticle. And in principle, this uh, presence of nanoparticle can also indicate, in principle, uh, even uh, the single molecule event. So to use this uh, for sensing, we actually developed a single step bioassay uh, where we have, let's say, a, a, a target uh, a sample, in this case, a serum sample. Uh, we take these nanoparticles and we mix it uh, a few uh, minutes, uh, let's say, 
and these nanoparticles are free floating, so they can, uh, you know, very quickly bind uh, their targets, and then uh, they get attached to the nanoparticle. And then we have uh, this uh, nanohole uh, chip. Uh, let's say it can be in a cartridge, uh, it can be in a microfluidic system, or it could be just really a simple flow cell. And uh, we uh, basically uh, uh, in introduce this mix, uh, 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 nanoparticle mix uh, serum uh, to this uh, chip. And uh, we put this uh, chip uh, into the uh, reader and uh, start uh, counting uh, the accumulation of the nanoparticle on the nanoholes. And we can digitally uh, count them, what we call plasmonic signal. And uh, we uh, show that, uh, you know, we can uh, operate quantitatively and real time. And uh, these are kind of the characteristic, uh, let's say, uh, calibration curves that we do uh, to find the limit of detection. And it shows that we can have a few uh, tens of picograms per milliliter uh, and over about uh, four orders of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, dynamic range. And these chips are fabricated, this uh, uh, nanostructured chips are fabricated with deep UV, deep UV lithography. Uh, so this is just showing a four inch uh, wafer, but uh, that's because that's what's available in our, let's say, uh, shared facility. But you can also imagine that it can be uh, uh, you know, a larger scale wafer. Uh, and uh, we typically use um, uh, one by one centimeter size chips, which you can also imagine a, a smaller uh, chip sizes for even more integrated systems. So you can have uh, many, many of these, uh, let's say, chips fabricated in a batch uh, format. So for application, we actually uh, looked at uh, sepsis. Um, uh, interestingly, sepsis affects uh, uh, more than 30 million uh, uh, people globally, and it is actually the most expensive hospital-treated condition. And sepsis is a uh, body's uncontrolled uh, inflammatory response to infection. Perhaps you have uh, heard even uh, the, the stories of sepsis, even kind of uh, in connection with the COVID cases uh, where, where people in intensive care uh, unit actually you know, uh, uh, develop uh, sepsis and it can go uh, to sepsis uh, shock. And uh, to go from sepsis to uh, sepsis shock, uh, actually the, the, the survival rate is very much dependent on time uh, because uh, the survival rate uh, basically drops about 8% every hour uh, the treatment uh, begins. So it's like really the minutes count uh, in terms of uh, uh, making this, uh, uh, you know, to, to overcome uh, this disease and its, uh, its um, complications. So to uh, show this uh, uh, rapid diagnostic application, we had this uh, uh, portable biosensor uh, that was uh, through another EU collaboration that we had, uh, that we had access to a sepsis biobank uh, in uh, Valdebran Hospital in Spain. And we have tested this uh, technology uh, directly with uh, patient serum samples. And now we are also working with plasma samples to detect two types of uh, uh, protein uh, uh, biomarkers that are related to inflammatory uh, response response, uh, procalcitonin and uh, CRP. And uh, we showed that our whole system from start to end uh, actually can do detection within uh, less than uh, 15 minutes. And we also showed that it can correlate with uh, gold standard uh, techniques. So now we are kind of looking at different uh, aspects of this technology. One is like, we didn't do multiplexing at that time. So we are kind of looking multiplexing with different types of things. And then the other uh, uh, direction is uh, kind of what Menno was mentioning to investigate how we can also you know, operate uh, not only endpoint, but in a continuous uh, manner. So this is uh, one example from plasmonics. We are also working with dielectric systems at the same time because they also have some interesting advantages uh, compared to, let's say, more uh, established plasmonic systems with gold, that they are more CMOS compatible. Uh, so we have been uh, working on uh, uh, utilizing uh, old dielectric uh, uh, metasurfaces uh, that can uh, uh, work again in the imaging format. Uh, so uh, in an earlier, we actually looked in hyperspectral imaging and more recently we have also kind of uh, looked at how they can work uh, with uh, fixed wavelength illumination and CMOS so they can kind of, uh, we can pay the way towards this uh, type of miniaturization uh, systems. And then here, because we also use uh, imaging, large area imaging uh, format, we coupled with um, uh, data processing techniques uh, to show that uh, dielectrics uh, can also be an interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, compatible systems. And uh, here the target as uh, you know, I have seen some questions in the audience that for instance, we have been uh, looking at uh, uh, extracellular vesicles uh, to, to detect because uh, we can kind of change the surfaces uh, to be functional uh, to different uh, targets. Targets. So that's one example. The other example that I want to give is uh, uh, the mid-IR part. So 
here, the interesting part uh, of the infrared uh, spectroscopy is that um, uh, infrared absorption spectroscopy in the infrared uh, gives uh, chemical specific detection. So if you have a molecule, uh, let's say if you shine an IR light, uh, you know, this molecule will absorb uh, certain uh, frequencies because those frequencies correspond to the characteristic uh, vibrational motion of molecules, which can be maybe uh, bending or different forms of uh, stretching. And the infrared spectrum, you will get these absorption peaks. Uh, and this uh, kind of like acts, uh, if you kind of uh, put together, it acts like this uh, uh, fingerprint. It uh, provides a chemical specific and label free detection. So infrared spectroscopy is interesting, but it also, uh, because of this chemical specificity, but it also has more limitations uh, compared to other uh, established spectroscopy or uh, label-free detection techniques, that it has low sensitivity, uh, which actually uh, makes a problem when you want to study with monolayers or low analyte concentrations. Another issue is the uh, absorption uh, of water uh, creates a problem, uh, as well as the instrumentation at the moment is uh, quite bulky. So if you, you know, the state of the art is uh, basically to rely on still FDIR uh, systems, which are tabletop uh, that I show you in our lab. And then uh, the optical, uh, the sorry, spectroscopic signals of different molecules, they are distinct, but they are still overlap. And this can <clears throat> complicate when you have very complex uh, samples. So this is where we use uh, IR, uh, <clears throat> sorry, nanophotonics within all things of, <coughs> sorry. surface enhanced infrared absorption spectroscopy, where we use these nano antennas and these nano antennas are designed to have a resonance that overlaps with the target uh, absorption bands of these analytes. And when there is uh, the analyte, uh, basically uh, the Bayer response, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, if you have normal a Bayer response, when you have the analyte on the structure, you have this uh, absorption uh, dips that are appearing, which we typically uh, 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 present in this uh, uh, different signal called uh, surface enhanced uh, infrared signal. And uh, within, uh, compared to, let's say, a Bayer uh, 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 or reference area on the nanostructured or metasurface area, you can actually have uh, quite a bit of uh, signal enhancement. And uh, lately, we have been actually looking uh, to uh, uh, make uh, metasurfaces that are um, uh, multi-resonant, uh, so that we can look at multiple different bands uh, simultaneously. And then, uh, because of uh, getting large amount of data, we also use artificial intelligence, so that we can actually really kind of go into uh, uh, use chemical specific detection uh, to do more uh, heterogeneous sample analysis. So one system, for instance, that we worked. Uh, is uh, uh, using uh, um, infrared spectroscopy in the imaging format. So we have here a pixelated, uh, what we call pixelated dielectric metasurface. And uh, interestingly, the unit cell of these uh, uh, structures actually allow us to have a very high Q resonances. And to go from high Q resonances to a broadband uh, operation, what we do is we have different regions that are changing in uh, size, that's the scaling factor. And in that way, we actually tune the resonant frequency of uh, these uh, uh, units. So we can have uh, therefore very, let's say broad uh, spectral coverage with very high Q uh, peaks. Uh, so here you see, uh, for instance, uh, 25 different elements and each of them are uh, covering 25 different uh, frequencies over a 400 uh, inverse wave number. And the other uh, aspect of it is that each uh, uh, pixel uh, corresponding uh, to a specific location has a specific resonance. So this gives us a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping between spectral and uh, spatial information. So for uh, to, to, to utilize this concept for sensing, what we do is uh, we put a, a layer of analyte and this layer of analyte has a specific absorption bands. Uh, therefore, uh, some uh, pixels uh, at some uh, frequencies maybe will not overlap, but uh, certain uh, pixels will, let's say, uh, start to overlap with this absorption uh, peak. So if you uh, kind of look at, uh, and then they will uh, kind of get uh, dimmed uh, by the, the resonances will get dimmed by the presence of uh, this analyte. So if you trace the envelope, you basically extract the absorption uh, uh, signature as if uh, like in, uh, in the spectrometer. And what is also interesting is that if you um, can integrate uh, this, uh, it can uh, also work in an imaging uh, format. And then the image that you get is actually digitization and uh, conversion of this absorption spectrum. So this is why we call it a molecular uh, barcode. And in fact, if you put different layers of uh, uh, analyte, uh, let's say pro proteins or polymers or a pesticide, 
because their absorption spectrum is distinct, we get different uh, molecular barcodes. And this is where uh, we think uh, this uh, uh, system can uh, actually lead to interesting developments uh, in the future. Uh, for instance, one aspect is that if you have a broadband uh, imaging detector, uh, a broadband source and a broadband imaging detector, because this surface is, uh, 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 this metal surface is frequency selective, we can do spectroscopy in a uh, compact uh, footprint. So we can go from IR systems to maybe something more uh, point of care uh, devices. And uh, it can also uh, enable, uh, let's say, interesting uh, AI uh, concepts. Uh, so we have been looking at uh, fabricating of uh, this type of device, uh, the, this type of uh, uh, structures in a see uh, uh, most compatible fabrication techniques. So this is actually something we showed recently that we can use um, uh, wafer scale fabrication of mid air uh, metal surfaces using this uh, membrane approach. So this is uh, this uh, kind of published about uh, last year uh, in fall and that we show that you can have uh, large area metal surfaces uh, and uh, that we can use for sensing or lensing or, uh, uh, or mid-IR optics, uh, but as well as uh, for uh, plasmonics even uh, with, uh, within the context of, um, um, uh, within the context of aluminum or CMOS compatible materials. So maybe just uh, one, uh, uh, two minutes uh, before I conclude, uh, just one example on the uh, live cell uh, or in, in particular single cell studies. It's not using nanophotonics, but this is uh, kind of uh, really interesting within the context of immunoengineering. Uh, we are looking cell-cell interaction at the individual uh, cell level. In particular, we are kind of looking um, at cytotoxic uh, immune cells and their interaction uh, with a uh, cancer cell. Uh, for this purpose, we uh, fabricated a, a high throughput um, um, PDMS-based biochip uh, that can enable uh, real-time analysis of uh, cell-cell interaction. So you see here a little uh, microwells, uh, which we call uh, picovels because their volume is uh, really small on the order of uh, 65 uh, picoliters. And we have a really large uh, numbers of them uh, in, uh, in this type of, uh, let's say, uh, small uh, chip. And uh, we can uh, load uh, these uh, chips um, uh, with uh, uh, a cancer cell and then the, uh, and in a subsequent step with immune cell. Uh, in this case, uh, in this uh, paper, we used a, a stochastic uh, um, a manual uh, pipetting. So in a uh, random manner, we have some wells that contains an individual, let's say, immune cell and a, a cancer cell. And we looked at the fighting uh, of uh, cancer cell uh, with uh, uh, T cell. And if the T cell is able to kill the tumor cell, we have a specific uh, signal. So we used an, um, a bright field, uh, a, a microscope, a time lab uh, microscope, which contains bright field, as well as uh, three different uh, uh, fluorescent channels uh, simultaneously. So we can look at you know, the death of or non death of uh, cancer cell uh, with the T cells. And these are kind of uh, the interactions that we see in uh, real time. Uh, and this is from one uh, field of view, but you can imagine that uh, we are scanning the stage. So we collect a large uh, uh, spatial uh, data as well as uh, temporal result data where we collect data over uh, one day with like 15 minutes uh, time integral. So this creates a large uh, set of uh, data. So this is where we actually um, uh, coupled a deep neural network to identify uh, the death uh, of the cell, the, the lysis of the cell uh, with different uh, immune cells. And uh, we were actually kind of uh, trying to compare the immunity of or, or uh, 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 the, the cytotoxicity of uh, CD4 immune cells uh, compared to CD8 cells. So this is uh, just, let's say, uh, uh, one example without nanophotonics, but kind of interesting uh, tools for uh, cellular analysis. So in conclusion, um, so I was uh, trying to give some examples that we do in our uh, lab, starting from point of care diagnostics to mid-IR spectroscopy and uh, single cell studies, where we use uh, photonics in coupled with uh, imaging and uh, fabrication fluidics and uh, surface chemistry together with data science. So maybe just I end uh, with uh, one final slide that, that we recently uh, uh, published a, a review article uh, called Advances and Applications of Nanophotonic Biosensors, where uh, kind of what uh, Menlo was uh, mentioning uh, from the beginning, let's say if you go miniaturization, maybe even uh, variable devices for the end use, but also for other uh, settings and make these devices really you know, uh, advanced in a, uh, in a sense that they are uh, sensitive, rapid, uh, connected, so we can really have a smart and uh, connected uh, future uh, um, for biosensors. So with that, I uh, uh, acknowledge uh, my group members. Um, uh, this has been still uh, within the COVID times with mask. 
and uh, my uh, scientific collaborators. And in fact, we are kind of looking at uh, uh, PhDs and uh, postdocs uh, if you're interested and, um, and the funding sources. And I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Hatice, for the great presentation. Wonderful. I'm opening the floor for, for questions. I see Jihad. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello. So I hope you hear me. Yeah, I can yes. hear you. Yeah, okay, good. So thank you very much. Really, I'm also very excited about this. It's, uh, I'm happy also that you're going closer, going to the near infrared. Hopefully, that we also we come to be close to the terahertz. <laughs> so, so one of the aspects that I see that if you go to the slide nine, please, that there is something I want to discuss. Slide nine, uh, oops, slide nine is, okay, it's not me there, but, oh, sorry, slide is blue. Slide nine, you said, right? Yes. This one? I don't oh, see sorry. the shirt. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I realized I stopped screen sharing. Okay. Oh, this one? The uh, one with this shows the system. Yeah, this is with imaging, maybe the following one, just with the system. I think maybe you're more interested in my MIDAR system. Yeah, uh, exactly. No, no, that okay. is one. Yeah, it was not slide different. nine, I but think. We, we back that, the, the one which is the, yeah. Okay, this maybe. Uh, actually, okay, so I can explain it. So there, okay. there is uh, the one which we use now, I, as I see that you use the CMOS uh, CCD camera for this uh, analyzing or detection of this, uh, for the imaging. So, and this is what I'm just saying that it's uh, hoping that you go for the, there is something also can cover very high, extremely high resolution in nanometers with the near uh, infrared, uh, with the near uh, field uh, terahertz microscopy. Uh -huh. And it would be very <laughs> close to feel for the integration. I mean, I see you said it's a mobile, 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 but I see still it's a, in, in my eyes, it's still a bulky, not, not that one. I mean, the one which is, with like a small tower with the, some, but yes. you need for this uh, lens, uh, maybe multiple lenses to do this uh, focusing uh, for the, uh, for using the CCD cameras in, in their approach in the beginning. So, uh, and this is why I think it's maybe a bottleneck you still optics inside the sensing. And this is also one of the aspects. I think if you switch to the terahertz, I don't know how, how you, uh, you thought about it. And also with very high resolution, also it's not only about imaging, this also can give a lot of uh, resonances, also like the uh, and, 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 and nano uh, photonics way that we also have a lot of resonances and very close and with the like uh, enhancers with meta surfaces and others very close to the terahertz. I mean, just in a question about how do you, do you see that? Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, indeed for the case of uh, optics, uh, you know, the, still you need uh, some sort of maybe light sources or uh, detectors, uh, right? Uh, indeed, uh, for the um, for the visible system, um, uh, we use uh, CMOS, or even for the IR system. That I thought maybe that's what you were referring to. You know, uh, the detectors and uh, light sources are still uh, at the end. Uh, you know, not uh, uh, not super compact, so they 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 will be there. Perhaps you can get rid of uh, the optics. Uh, uh, you know, in it, but uh, the the. The, the hardware itself will be there unless maybe you know the the, the surface itself is uh, also you know uh, maybe generating the light or or kind of detecting the light the detector itself becomes uh, the, um, the the sensing element uh, directly um, so uh, you can I, have, you yeah, can I think this is yes, exactly what I meant I mean the sources and detectors would be integrated with the sample and that's but of course, you have to go for technology that to, this integration with the lasers and sources is the same cost of the sample preparation. And this is exactly yes. what we are trying to push in terahertz. And this is possible because we are producing the, yeah, exactly. This is what we are producing, the terahertz signal and the detectors in the same chip. And it's to do this, and this is in the cost of the sample or the sample preparation because you do also a lot of sample preparation as I see, and you have to have different aspect to get the exact 
uh, sample on the on, on your uh, let's say test area or the area want to be tested i don't know how this is a problem also for aligning these things and also you have one example of manual pipes uh, that it would be in somewhere so this all aspects would be maybe main, a lot of solved using a full monolithically integrating for the sources and detectors including the samples yes mm -hmm. one of these Exactly, this is the, 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 the mobile things that you need some uh, certain optics and everything. And yeah, right. and we, yeah this is one of the, 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 the points that I want to mention here. Right, right. So indeed, like I think like if you can, uh, for the full integration, I have to say, uh, you have to really watch out about the cost of the system. So in, in uh, one model that we are kind of using in this case is not like variable or kind of uh, port like, like super connected devices, but still maybe standalone, uh, but still quite mobile. Of course, this is a still bulky. It's on a research grade. It uses optics. It doesn't have to use optics, but still, you know, we kind of design in a way that the the the, the source and the and the detector are separate than the chip itself, so that I can make uh, you know for the chip as the consumable, not the reader. Um, but if you completely fully integrate, then you need to think about uh, the the. Uh, the cost of the entire system uh, and, you know, the, whether the, you know, disposability, usability, uh, you know. Of, uh, yeah, I mean, this is also can be in this uh, different technology that uh, chip to chip or let's say side by side or the back to back chips. This is also not that ambiguous. I mean, just concerning about this optics and these things and the power, whatever, you put also a computer here. So, I mean, I just want to say that in Terra, there is a lot of possibility also to include the communication because in communication we're also using and we also can transmit the data exactly and assuming uh, using also the the the, uh, the terahertz signal itself so there is a lot of company and there's a big story about that we are, we 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 are we are make working on on a big proposal on that but i mean just to mention that uh, 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 for uh, miniaturization and the future for this I think it's also could be possible using the same technology with nanophotonics, but I, I see the usability of for terahertz, it will be very beneficial in, in your scheme. This is what I'm, I'm just want to say. Mm, I see, okay, I will be happy to follow up uh, to hear more. In particular, you mentioned the resolution, the spatial resolution. So normally, yes. of course, the wavelength, it scales with the wavelength. So I'm curious how you can go to nanoscale while still going in a very compact. Yeah, with techniques, yes, it's, it's, it's possible. This we are doing already. We do a lot of imaging in this nanoscale and in, uh, in this uh, near field uh, uh, SNOMS uh, uh, techniques. Yeah, but uh, so when you have an SNOM technique by itself, it's very, you know, yeah, it's not yeah. compact, right? <laughs> yeah, and this is what we are doing with this SNOMS. I mean, with integration, this is something else. Yeah, I mean, things with optics different than. It's a bit in the terahertz, yes. So You're yeah, right. maybe you can you can follow up. Uh, yeah, sorry, I take too much time. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, no problem, no problem. That's why we are here, right? So um, we have one more question. I don't know, Hatice, if you have a few more minutes, and yes. Nikki is also still available, yeah. then please feel free to yeah to ask your question. Hi, Hatice. It was a really nice presentation. So I have a question. I I want to know, like, do you can you really measure the real samples with the IR uh, sensor, or do ah. you need a pre-treatment to measure the sample because there will be number of molecules? Right. Uh, for the case of near IR, we do real samples. So that uh, that is what I was just trying to show that we work directly with uh, serum uh, or even now plasma samples. So it uh, it, it it can work. For the case of uh, media R, uh, so the uh, the you know still uh, uh, there is an um, uh, uh, you know if, uh, if you want to work in solution that's uh, that is uh, still like certain considerations you need to take into account that your resonances are not hampered by the uh, water, but if you can like introduce the sample and just wash it out uh, and do measurements in dry condition, uh, yes, you can work uh, uh, also with uh, complex samples. Um, uh, you just need to functionalize your surface. We, in fact, we have done uh, some preliminary results already on that for a, you know, for an, um, uh, for a specific uh, protein biomarker. Okay, that, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, uh, we still have a couple more questions. Pankaj and Camille, uh, may I maybe ask you to to send an email directly to Hatice after 
All right. Very good. So I, think I suggest there's a you close the. Uh, no, okay, sorry. If, if you still have time, I'm certainly available. So please yeah, come in, okay. feel free. Yes. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you a lot for the presentation. It was really interesting. I was more interested in the, um, in the point of care. So I don't really see how you can like multiplex uh, with, with the different biomarkers. Um, within the same, um, like uh, the same chip, uh, can you explain how you are working to multiplex uh, these different yeah. biomarkers? The, the work that we published is not multiplex, but we have uh, an under review paper that is multiplexed. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, I mean, uh, for multiplexing, what you need to do is basically uh, the, 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 the system has a large field of view, right? Uh, so you can functionalize different spots with different capture antibodies. Okay, and those are like um, specific um, locations that you separate really from each yes. other? Okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay, we okay. physically, we, we make it in a microarray format. So I, I say it microarray, but we didn't, you know, when we did PCD and uh, CRP, we detected in a sequentially different chips. Uh, oh, sorry, here. Uh, but um, so um, the multiplexing, the real multiplexing work is uh, still uh, ongoing, uh, kind of like okay, okay. finalized, hopefully. Okay. And for sepsis, uh, why did you use a CRP over IL-6 uh, detection? Ah, so that's also a good question. So, uh, I, I, you know, we, uh, in fact, the uh, other ongoing work uh, that is also using IL-6 PCT. <laughs> And uh, uh, and uh, uh, IL one B. So uh, um, the the CRP was mostly kind of like to identify whether you know we kind of uh, talk with the doctors and they still always checked CRP uh, whether they would like to you know if, uh, maybe administer uh, antibiotics. Um, uh, it, it, the input really came from uh, the doctors where they kind of find it uh, useful biomarkers and they always uh, include CRP. But in fact, the range of CRP, concentration of CRP was very high. This is why we didn't put in the same multiplexing chip uh, because okay. PCT concentrations are very low in, mm -hmm. as well as IL-6. So IL-6 and PCT matched well uh, when we did multiplexing. Okay, and uh, just a quick last question was about the microfluidic you use uh, over this chip. So, um, how did you implement it? Like, is it um, still in work or with a pump or? With uh, yeah. So in this case, in fact, we didn't use microfluidics uh, really. Um, so it's uh, it's we just you know uh, the essay is that you you know you kind of like mix it and then you just put in a kind of in a, not even a flow channel, but a chamber. You just put the glass slide, uh, glass cover slide and put in the system. So it's not like a really fluidic uh, uh, system because we don't need to wash this assay. Mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. you are just very interested in endpoint measurements, you just you know look at things accumulated in time and things only come to the surface becomes visible. Things away from the surface uh, is not giving uh, the uh, plasmonic response. So, um, uh, but we are also now considering the fluidic systems, uh, of course, and uh, it creates uh, the pump and other stuff, but maybe for uh, scientific investigations, it's still fine. But uh, for this uh, thing, we really didn't have uh, any, any flow. Uh, and so you, you still get uh, less than 15 minutes to get the, the, the results. Yeah, so the, the, it's, it's just uh, it's uh, 15 minutes. And of course, uh, that depends on the concentration. For very low concentration, you may need to wait a bit longer. Yeah, OK, OK, I see. And do, would you think that, uh, that putting um, um, like a small PDMS chamber or PMMA, I don't know, over the chip would like reduce the, the depletion layer and like uh, more um, 
concentrate the the number of particles accelerated detection or that's a good question. This is something that uh, my student is also looking into, like the microfluidic effect in the system. Uh, I cannot uh, say how they can work. And also, we are also interested to wash them, uh, non-specific ones. So um, if you actually have ideas, uh, uh, we will be very happy to. to yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, can I can I send you, can we send you an email because I'm part of the of the census team and I think. Uh, because we would um, like to work with the with the technique and the, so maybe okay. it would be good to reach out. Okay, uh, are you in the EPFL census team or T? Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. you are local, so we can surely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but uh, anyway, thank you very much for the presentation. Sure. Yes, absolutely. And thank you also to mm -hmm. Menno to both of you Minute, for the great presentations and your availability. And yeah, I'm closing this session and um, we will have more Euro Tech Talks coming up, but we will be covering all different kinds of scientific fields. So the next one will be on additive manufacturing on the 22nd of June, but maybe in autumn, we will dive once more into, into the bioengineering field. So thank you all to speakers and audience also for the questions and I hope to see you soon. Okay, and if there are other questions, I think maybe we couldn't answer it, they can feel free to email us. Perfect, yes. Thank you. <laughs>